my brother sent me something uh, in one of the, uh, that it said, this may be your last chance to see Ron Rash. And I thought, you know, rumors of my impending doom. Or, uh, <laughs> uh, not quite. <laughs> that sounded pretty scary to me. Uh, but I, I am here. <laughs> and I hope to be here for a little while longer. So that, that was kind of a sense of foreboding that I heard that. Um, that's all driving down this road, though. And I, I hadn't thought about this in years, but. Uh, uh, it was, I think it was on this, I'm pretty sure this is on this road when I was, uh, well, not I, but my, my grandparents lived, uh, they grew up in uh, the Lester community, and my father, grand, my uh, father's family, and my grandparents were in Asheville during the Depression, and uh, I wrote an article called Nana from Heaven, and the reason I named it that was that uh, in the middle of the Depression, nobody had any money, and a banana truck, or a truck carrying bananas, I guess, wrecked on one of these streets right in town and all these bananas flew out and, and every all the people were getting these banana, you know this exotic fruit and uh, my grandmother told that story and I, I was remembering that and also i just want to say something to Emika over here y'all know her she's the one that who founded this store and uh, she she is the, the soul of Asheville. she really and, and if you If you, you know, if you've been in Asheville a while or if you're new here, I mean, this store, I couldn't remember when this store was here. and It was about the only thing downtown. And uh, thank you. And she's got a book of poems coming out if you do, pretty close soon. So keep that in mind. Uh, all right. Well, I, uh, I thought I'd start off. I, I just found uh, I've got a book of uh, my collected poems. Uh, are coming out in, in France in translation in March. And that's kind of exciting because Baudelaire and Rimbaud and Ponch, all those writers meant so much to me. And uh, yeah, I'm sure it causes much consternation to my French one teacher, Madame Ed. And, <laughs> and, uh, I've told a couple of stories about her, but uh, she, uh, I failed her class. Like I made a thirty-three for the. I made a three for the last half year. A three, and that was the record. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was making a joke uh, a few years ago. I was, you know, near where I grew up, and uh, I, I, a couple of people there were have been my high school classmates, and, I, and I'd just come back from France. And uh, I said, Madame Head would just really be upset to know that you know the French, had, you know, invited me there. And, <laughs> and, and, and uh, uh, about two days later, two or three days later, uh, I got an email from Madame Head. <laughs> and, and she said, Ron, you, you're so modest. You know, I remember you. You took French with me three years, and he made A's every nine weeks. And she confused me with my brother. <laughs> my younger brother. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I just thanked her for the compliment. <laughs> and so she still, I think, is uh, convinced. You know, the other guy's probably in some meth trailer. You know? <laughs> but, um, but I thought, uh, you know, don't tell them. Uh, I thought I'd start off with, with a poem uh, because it kind of ties into this novel. And, 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 and this kind of goes back to uh, my uh, grand. Grant, my mother's family is from a little community called Aho between Blowing Rock and Boone, North Carolina. And uh, there, uh, there's a farm, there, there, there's a farm, and still a lot of the lands, including my part of it, is, is still in the family, which is wonderful. But um, above the, the farm is a cemetery, and the, the cemetery uh, is just a barbed wire fence between the cemetery and our land. And uh, when I was a kid, sometimes uh, after a storm, uh, a wreath or some flowers would be blown over onto uh, the pasture or into the pasture. And uh, as a kid, sometimes I'd be sent up there to, to put it back. I mean, I didn't know which grave, but I was you know, told to, to do this and to do it very reverently. And so I would pick this up and put it back inside, you know, inside the cemetery. And it was always, just, even as a kid, it was, it was something a little, not, it wasn't scary, but just this sense of almost like a boundary between the living and dead, you know, you're putting this across there. And that, that, that has stayed with me. And uh, years ago, um, I was thinking about that. And 
And I thought, uh, for some reason, it kind of went into a, a sense of a, a man who had, uh, who, who owned that land, a different kind of man, different, and uh, and it, uh, he finds a bouquet on his land and he sees that a black-eyed Susan's kind in his, uh, his own yard. And he realizes, he knows that his wife grew up and uh, the wife's first husband is in the cemetery. And uh, the note, there's a little note on it called Black Eyed Seasons. The hay was belt buckle high when rain let up. Three days sun baked stalks dry. By midday all but the far pasture mowed, raked into windrows. Above June sky still blue as I drove my tractor on up the ridge to the far pasture where strands of sagging barbed wire marked where my land stopped, church land began. Knowing I'd find some grave gift, flowers, flag, styrofoam cross blown on my land. And so first walked the boundary, made sure what belonged till on the other side got returned. Soon enough saw black-eyed Susans, the same kind planted in my yard, a note tight folded tied to a bone. Always was all that it said, which said enough where I knew what grave that note belonged to. And knew as well who wrote it. He and her married three months when he died. Now always young, always their love and first bloom. Too new to life to know life was no honeymoon. Instead, she learned that lesson from me over three decades. What fires our flesh spark too soon put out by time and just surviving. And learn why old folks called it getting hitched. Because like mules, so much of life was one row you never saw the end of. And always he was close by, under a stone you could see from the porch. Wedding pictures she kept hid in her drawer. His black and white flashbulb grin, grinning at me like he knew. He'd made me more of a ghost to her than he'd ever be. There in that moment, that word in my hand, his grave so close, if I'd had a shovel near, I'd have dug him up right then, shown her the bones, made her see what the truth was. For memory is always the easiest thing to love, to keep alive in the heart. After a while, I laid the note in bouquet where they belonged. Never spoke a word about it to her, then, forever. Even when she was dying, calling his name with her last words. Sometimes on a Sunday afternoon, I'll cross the pasture, make sure her stone's not starting to lean. If it's early summer, bring black-eyed Susans for her grave. Leave a few on his as well. For soon enough, we'll all be sleeping together beyond all things that ever mattered. So... Uh, And that, uh, that I'd always, always wanted to uh, place a, uh, a novel on that form and uh, finally was uh, able to uh, with this book, first one, you know, I, I just couldn't ever find the right one. And so uh, this, this book gave me that opportunity. So uh, uh, it, it is set there and, and also the cemetery plays a pretty big role so, uh, you know, I think that, uh, that played a part. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, about 35 years ago, I had a uh, friend of mine tell me a story um, about uh, a murder that had happened uh, in, the, in South, I think it was actually South Carolina, but it was... Uh, what had happened was that during the second part of the uh, 20th century, mid-century, 20th century, there was a, uh, a, a man. <sighs> it's kind of hard to read. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, there was this, this, uh, this this story the guy told me, and in, in the story it was a uh, it was about a, a true story. This guy had uh, been to a uh, uh, I'm having trouble concentrating. I'm sorry. Uh, 
Ah, the story. <laughs> the story uh, was a uh, he a young man who was 19 years old had, had fallen in love with a young woman in his community. And uh, the family was very socially prominent. And uh, he eloped with her despite the family uh, being very, very much against it. And, and so um, he stayed near the community. Family was still outraged. And then he got drafted uh, into a, a war. And uh, while he was gone, uh, the woman um, was evidently murdered by uh, the uh, uh, family. I mean, that's the true story. Mm -hmm. And 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 my friend, did, you know, it, it, it was actually a good thing for a writer because he, he didn't have all the details. Evidently, a number of people in the community actually knew about this, but he did not, you know, whether he found out or not was very, kind of unclear. But anyway, that story has stayed with me. I mean, I always knew or thought I knew that, uh, you know, you know, if you can't make a good novel out of that, give up. I mean, <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, that's just a wonderful you know, I mean, what a premise. And I think in a way, it was so good, it, it kind of paralyzed me because uh, it was almost like I, I kind of got the track of that in my head and I just couldn't really seem to make the thing come alive. And, and uh, as, as I've told people, this is every novel I've written, even Serena, which is my kind of my big book, uh, took three years and this one took six. And I kept take, making wrong turns. I ended up writing like, over a thousand pages, uh, kept getting it wrong. Um, and finally, uh, it came together and it's about 260 pages. So, uh, but I actually, I've got some students here and they remember, I, I would just come in in despair because I, I'd say, I think I got it, I think I got it. No, no you don't, no you don't. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I go back and, and finally, finally, uh, I, I actually, I told my students, I said, uh, you know, that um, I knew I'd gotten it when I started driving real slow. Because when I start driving real slow, uh, what that means is that I uh, have finally, uh, I'm scared I'm going to die because I know I've almost got it finished. <laughs> so, so, so I actually uh, um, finished it up. But anyway, that, that story, but that, then, but then, as I say, finally, you know, the novel really became, a lot of it came about the parents contemplating how far they would go. And, and, you know, perceiving it as an act of love and, uh, you know, that we want to, you know, the, he's made this mistake, you know, now he's overseas and, and we're going to try to, uh, you know, to really say, you know, uh, take care of him, give him a new start. And, and in a way, this, this novel really is about love, uh, different, you know, sometimes different justifications through love and, um, you know, with other, you know, other parts of it. You know the sense of uh, when it's at its best. Uh, you know, there's there's a character named uh, Blackburn Gant who actually is the caretaker of the cemetery, and Blackburn is uh, someone who has had polio in his fifties. I mean, in the nineteen it's nineteen fifty one, so he's had polio. He's kind of become a, 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 a an outcast of sorts. His family has actually gone to Florida. They kind of left him behind. You know, they're they're a little bit kind of ashamed of him. Uh, so he's 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 up there on the, the caretaker alone. And in the novel, Jacob, who, who's the young soldier who's eloped with this young woman, actually is a you know actually when he goes to Korea, he has the uh, caretaker Jacob. I mean uh, Blackburn look after her so he's caretaking now the dead but also the living in the book and so he's looking after her trying to protect her and, and you've got this family that's that's seriously thinking about you know we gotta we gotta get rid of her so that's kind of, that's the the conflict in the book but as, as i got deeper into it i uh you know i i, I, I realized a couple of other things about the book but one it was about and, and I really started realizing how interesting this was to me. Uh, this was one of the last times where almost all communication between people would be uh, face to face. You know, 1951. I mean, obviously, people had some people had most people, many people had telephones, but 
almost all, and, and so I really became more conscious of that. You know, how is that different? Uh, what, what have we lost maybe? Uh, maybe what we gained because, uh, you know, face-to-face uh, -face it's so much more dramatic. And also potentially, you know, bad things can happen, even violence. And so I became more interested in that. And uh, it really, you know, kind of uh, got, got me kind of uh, into the book even deeper. But it starts in Korea. He's actually a, uh, Jacob has been drafted, conscripted, and he's over in, he's in Korea. And uh, he, he has not been really tested the way the, every, pretty much every other character in the book has been tested, uh, at, the, at least at the beginning. And I really felt like I had to get the read. I had to start the story with him because he's, he's been a little bit immature. His parents he still have a kind of influence over him. He's, there, there are moments when he kind of doubts, maybe I have made a mistake marrying this woman. Uh, he's a good person, but he still has a little bit of that, you know, almost like a, a you know, slight fever. But uh, in this moment, he actually will have to uh, kind of get to where, you know, he, to the core. And I, and I think sometimes, you know, sometimes uh, I think with a serious writer, uh, even violence is more ultimately about revelation of character. You know, you're getting to the core of someone. Uh, and so this, uh, this thing will do that. I would also mention I've got a relative, a Millard Rash, who lives in Leicester. And Millard was in the uh, Korean War. Uh, he was a Marine, or Korean conflict. He was a Marine. And uh, he, he told me some stories about it. And, and, and he told uh, two things really stuck in my head. The first is how cold Korea was. Uh, if you know about that war, <laughs> uh, it's nothing like Vietnam. It, there's no jungles. I mean, this was a harsh, brutal landscape. The other thing was because he was a Marine, he, uh, he was in some really intense fighting. And uh, one time he was telling me about the fighting and he said, uh, then he said, then the fighting got thick, thick. And that word has stayed with me because of what that meant was hand to hand. You know, I mean, you're, you're just right there. So this, this is the opening of Jacob home, Jacob on guard duty. Jacob was on guard duty, posted beside a river that separated the two armies. The night was colder than any he'd experienced back in Watauga County. This cold did more than seep into his skin. It encased fingers and feet in iron, made teeth rattle like glass about to break. No layering of wool and cotton beneath the pile line parka allayed it. For weeks, Jacob had been waiting for the cold lift. Now it was March, but this place observed no calendar. The river was still frozen. Jacob envisioned ice all the way to the bottom. No current, fish stalled as if mounted. The river had a name, but Jacob didn't allow it to lodge in his memory. Since stepping onto the pier put a sign, his goal had been to forget, not remember. At Fort Polk, he'd heard all manner of stories about what awaited him in Korea. Much of it was horse crab. The NK ate rats and snakes raw, could see in the dark like cats. But some stories were true, including how they would crawl into an outpost slit a soldier's throat, then recede into the night. Even if you were on the opposite side of a river, they'd come across and kill only one man when they might have killed three or four. They were leaving a message. We're saving you for next time. Mm -hmm. Though the river was frozen, Jacob knew that didn't matter. Two nights earlier, a North Korean had decapitated another unit sentry. Crawled over the ice to do it. Jacob scanned the flat, soundless snowscape before him. At least the moon was full tonight. A hunter's moon, they called it back home. It silvered the crystals atop the river. If not wary of an enemy's knife, Jacob would have taken time to marvel at such shimmering beauty. But even this small moment must be blocked. Jacob wanted Korea to be a house entered and then left, the door locked forever just had to survive.
12 days ago for the first time his unit had been in a fight. He'd survived that. Getting home was what mattered. According to Naomi's last letter, Dr. Egan said the baby would come in May. That was the talisman Jacob carried with him. He could not die. God, fate, something destined him and Naomi to have a life together. Many soldiers brought something from home to help protect themselves. A rabbit's foot, a lucky coin, a playing card. So why not a belief? Yet last week, Daughtery, despite two crucifixes and a matchbox filled with four-leaf clovers, had stepped on a mine and been killed. So Jacob's eyes did not leave the frozen river, his ears listening for the rub of cloth on ice, scrape of fingernails. Most nights, the wind howled across this hard country, but tonight a rare, disquieting silence. <laughs> The rest of the unit was encamped 50 yards behind him. Chosenia trees, muffling snores and dream mutterings. Did the North Koreans ever sleep? Perhaps all they did was wait until you did. The silence was palpable as the cold. Villagers believed the ghost of dead Americans wandered these mountains. Kishin, they called them. Most men laughed at the notion. But because of where he'd grown up, Jacob could not. He wished he could smoke, but the flare of a match, glow of a tip might end your life. For an hour, Jacob had barely moved. Slight shift of the rifle, slow turn of his head, but nothing more, as Sergeant Abrams advised. His fingers searched for the pack of gum in his parka pocket, until remembering he'd given it to a villager's child two days ago. Jacob looked up again, only the moon, not a single star. He had the sensation that both armies had quietly withdrawn, leaving him alone beside this frozen river. Then, as if to signal otherwise, a movement on the opposite side of the ice. Jacob shifted his rifle, laid his glove finger inside the trigger guard. He watched the far bank, the ice over shallows. Nothing moved. After hours of guard duty, a man easily imagined things, could even hallucinate. Wind became whispers, shadows thickened in the flesh. Jacob resettled his finger on the stock. On guard duty, the only thing worse than being alone was the fear you weren't. Letting them one dangle in the crook of his right arm, Jacob clutched the parka's hood tighter. He bared the glove wrist to check his watch, found comfort in the second hand slow but steady circling, the tick of passing time. A few minutes more and Murphy would replace him. It was mid afternoon in North Carolina. He imagined Naomi in front of the fireplace, half a world away. On the edge of Jacob's vision, a shadow shifted. He found the rifle safe and slowly turned his head. From the darkness, a form lunged, a knife blade tearing through Jacob's parka, the tip breaking his rib cage. He grabbed the man's arm, dropping the M1 as they fell to the ground, Jacob rolling on top. He reached out, felt his rifle's barrel and grasped it, only then realized he hadn't fixed the bayonet. As Jacob's hand found the stock and then the trigger guard, the enemy soldier clasped Jacob's waist. They tumbled off the bank and onto the ice. Did not break and the landing knocked them apart. The M1 slipped free and skittered out of reach. North Korean wore only a sweater, pants, and boots. He was shorter than Jacob, but square-shouldered like a wrestler. His hand still gripped the knife. Both men panted, each breath whitening the air between them. Once their breathing steadied, they listened. Both banks were silent. Jacob jerked off his gloves, pulled his bayonet from its scabbard. Neither man tried to stand. They crawled closer, stabbing at each other. But the ice allowed little force in their thrust. Jacob's even less so because of the parka. Then the other man crouched and sprang forward. 
His knife blade glanced Jacob's neck, drew blood. North Korean's free hand slipped and he fell face first, rising to his knees as Jacob's bayonet slashed his left cheek from ear to mouth, molars glinting white where the skin flapped open. One hand on the ice for balance, they swiped and jabbed, everything slow and unrelenting as a nightmare. Again, they came together, arms entangled as they rolled onto their sides. Mid-river, they broke apart, each gasping for breath, each knowing a shout would bring fire from both shores. On their knees, less than a yard apart, they saw each other clearly, the bright moon stage lighting their struggle. The man's hair was long for a soldier's, and he had to sweep it from his face. Dark smears marked their path across the ice. Most of the blood was Jacob's. The blood on his left hand had frozen, sealing the fingers together. Jacob flexed and unflexed a fist to free them. As the men watched each other, their breaths slowed. Jacob noticed a mole on the North Korean's chin, a bit of wool unraveling on his sweater. All seemed charged with significance. The soldier lunged, not to stab, but to knock Jacob off balance. Jacob fell and the ice crackled. The other man was on top now. Jacob raised his left arm and their forearms locked a moment before the Korean's blade raked Jacob's wrist. Another stab sent the knife into Jacob's left shoulder and his arm went limp as more ice fractured. Jacob felt a sudden distance from everything around him, even his own heaving breaths. The bayonet slipped out of his hand, whirled and time unbuckled into a luminous vanishing, his body a burdensome shell so easily shed. Let it all go, it won't hurt long. But he could not let go of Naomi. As the North Korean raised his knife, Jacob's right arm shoved the man off balance. The blade tip pierced the ice as Jacob twisted free. Inside the moon's circle of light, the soldier pried his knife from the ice. Jacob picked up his bayonet. Almost ceremonially, they knelt before each other. Their breathing slowed, widening the silence. Rising into a crouch, the North Korean slipped, fell backward, his flexed elbows breaking the ice and plunging him into the water. Half submerged, but still wielding the knife, the man sought purchase, lifted one arm onto the ice, then the second. Jacob dropped his bayonet, crawled forward, and shoved the Korean under. When the head thrashed to the surface, Jacob flat against the ice now, grabbed a fistful of hair and shoved harder, deeper. As he did, a spar of ice broke off beneath his right forearm. For a long moment, the arm, flexed rigid, hovered above the dark water. Time slowed more. Moonlight pressed against his back as if it too had weight. Jacob eased the arm back. Sternum pressed against the ice, he tried not to breathe, but the pounding of his heart could not be stilled. To be my heart that breaks it, Jacob thought, almost in wonder. The beating slowed. He tightened his stomach muscles, lifted his arms and chest off the ice, breathed. He placed his right hand beneath his stomach, pressed just hard enough to raise himself and balance the weight between hand and knees. Carefully turned, slid the bayonet into its scabbard and eased his body onto firmer ice. Then Jacob heard a tick and a second. He looked back, saw no movement on the bank. A third tick came and Jacob realized that the sound came from downriver and not on the ice, beneath it. Then the knife blade broke through. It gleamed like a silver flame in the moonlight. 
Jacob waited till certain the blade remained motionless. Using his good arm for balance, he slid one knee forward, then the other, making his way towards shore inches at a time. For the first time, he was scared. Jacob could almost feel a rifle barrel steadying its aim on his back. Thought he heard a whisper from the opposite bank. Keep going, he told himself. They'll shoot whether you're moving or not. <clears throat> Jacob finally felt sand and pulled himself ashore. Someone whispered Jacob's name, then louder, more insistent. Murphy's voice, but it came from the opposite shore, as did a flashlight beam sweeping the ice. Above the bank where Jacob crouched, there was movement. Two, maybe three men. They spoke in Korean as their rifle bolts levered into place. Shots rang out and were returned. There was an undercut in the bank. Tree roots brushed his face as he crawled inside. After a few feet, the undercut narrowed, came to an end. Jacob pressed his back against the damp wall. The roof rubbed against his shoulder and he settled himself. And as he did, dirt sifted down. Jacob smelled the earth's dankness. He wondered how deep the knife's punctures were, how much blood he had lost to die here and never be found. Jacob tried not to think about what the villagers believed or what he himself had witnessed back in Watauga County, ghost lanterns forever searching the flank of Brown Mountain. Shooting had ceased, but the North Koreans be watching the river. Wait until the moon is down, Jacob told himself, maybe then, but he was already drifting into unconsciousness. This is, as I've told people, my happiest book. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? I mean, really. It is. It, it really is. I mean, it, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I thought, you know, this, I'm at a time in my life I want to write a book of affirmation. <laughs> and, so, but I can't help it, you know. I mean, I, you know, I read too much Poe and Faulkner, you know, it just, it just contaminated, or Flannery O'Connor, I guess, but. Uh, but it really, yeah, but uh, but I, I I felt like that scene was essential because I think Jacob, in some ways, is the character who, uh, as I said, he's kind of had a little bit of an easy life, but I think everything's kind of been narrowed to that moment. And after that, you know, he knows, you know, Naomi's going to be the one that's going to, uh, and he does get, get home, he does get back across the river, you know, so I do get him home, obviously. Uh, <laughs> that was nice of you, <laughs> yeah, 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 that, uh, yeah, probably, uh, I just, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, but uh, the character it really became the heart of the book, and, and this I think once again was why I was having so much trouble with this book. I had that story, but uh, as I got a few years into this thing, actually it stopped. I actually wrote a book called In the Valley, uh, you know, a collection of short stories, the novella, and then I kind of went back to the book, and finally uh, I started to realize that Blackburn Gant, uh, the caretaker of the cemetery, could be really in a way it's more his book than anybody's, and. Uh, he uh, really, he just embodies everything decent about us as human beings. Uh, I think I, I really wanted to write about a good man, a good human being. And uh, so uh, he certainly does that. And, and his heroism in the book, you know, uh, I really uh, came to kind of admire him. <laughs> and, I, and, and as I was working on this book, I mean, it's been such a dark time in our country. I just thought, you know, we kind of need to be remembered about people who are decent. Um, you know, Faulkner once said that he believed that most people are a little bit better than their circumstances ought to allow. And uh, I, now most, you know, he didn't say all, but I, I, you know, I still believe that. And I, I, but I think as a country, maybe we have to believe it too. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, Blackman kind of embodied that, but he, uh, when he had polio uh, as a child, when his, his, his father, uh, was the one, father, very hard man, tough man, in some ways very bitter, sharecropper. And uh, when, when Blackburn had polio, it was his father who would, uh, who really pushed him to get up and start walking. Uh, his father would rub liniment and, and, he, and, and Blackburn 
would feel like it was almost like he was angry as he did it. You know, he was doing it so intensely. And uh, and and Blackbird kind of had this sense of that, you know, almost like he's when he's making him walk, it's hurting. But that's his father's it's an act of love. I mean, and and uh, I think for that generation of men, at least particularly in the region I know, uh, this region, uh, they could, you know, they, they didn't use the word love, but they showed it sometimes in a way uh, that could be misconstrued. But there's a moment in Blackburn's life when his father does more obviously kind of uh, show show him something. Black was 14, he and his father worked side by side, hoeing, bailing, feeding, mucking. They always something more a farm demanded. During a full day's work, they'd exchange a handful of words. His father had never been much for talking, smiling for that matter. If Blackburn spilled milk or missed weeds, his father's words were few but severe. When the job was well done, the most Blackburn hoped for was a nod including on a blistering August Saturday when the two of them alone harvested half an acre of cabbage. Cutting the heads from the cobby stalks was work enough, but carrying the burlap sacks from the bottom land up to the shed was even harder. On those summer Saturdays, his father left after supper to sit with other men who gathered at Hampton's store. When he returned, he always brought Hampton and his sister a bottle of soda pop. Blackburn never asked to go with him, never thought to ask. But on that August Saturday, supper eaten, he, fit, he fetched his hat and a lantern and looked at Blackburn. Come or not, he said, walking out the door without waiting for a response. His father had long legs, Blackburn trailed behind him. But as the store came into sight, his stride shortened until they walked together. Once there, his father stopped took a nickel from a change purse and held it out. You ain't gonna get it for me? Blackburn asked. His father shook his head. On the porch, the men passed, Blackburn passed, barely acknowledged it. Though all spoke or nodded to his father. Inside, Mrs. Hampton was behind the counter. His father tipped his hat before turning to the metal drink box. Blackburn watched him lift the lid Peer at the metal caps through showing his hand, shoving his hand into the gray slush, fetching out a green bottle with seven up on its side. After freeing the cap, his father took a, a swallow as if testing the drink's quality, then paid and went outside. Blackburn read the cap names. Some he'd never tasted. Cheer wine, knee high, you who. Each time he pulled a bottle from the slush, the surrounding cap swayed like fishing bobbers. He set it on a cheer wine, gave Mrs. Hampton the nickel, and went out. His father leaned against the porch rail. Chairs were filled, so several men perched beside his father on the rail. Others sat on the steps, leaving a gap for customers to pass. Blackburn went down the steps. Wooden drink crates were stacked beside the porch. Blackburn turned one onto its side, sad. Men spoke of crops and weather, told a few jokes and tall tales. At eight o'clock, Mrs. Hampton turned off the lights and locked the door, but the men lingered. The darkness made the men quieter, often attentive to a single voice. Later, Blackburn would have a similar feeling in the theater when he walked in late after the house lights dim. On the third Saturday night, a new man joined the regulars. As Blackburn passed, he'd elbowed the fellow beside him, spoke, and then laughed. His father told Blackburn to go on inside. But through the screen door, he heard him clear. That's my son. And he's already twice the man you'll ever be. If you say another word, to or about him, I swear before God, one or the both of us will end up in a hospital or a casket. You understand? The stranger answered, yes, sir. His father had come in the store then. 
got his seven up, but waited until Blackburn bought his drink. They went back out together. The chairs of the stranger and the man who sat beside him were empty. Which one do you want? His father asked. <laughs> Uh, and just one more brief section, a, a character that kind of came the last couple of years that really interested me and, and I came to really enjoy was a, a doctor, the town doctor. He, he's been somebody who's been very good to Naomi and Jacob. You know, he's been taking care of Naomi. Uh, the, the family has tried to intimidate him, but he's not he's not going that way. But his story kind of became interesting because he, he he's a widower. Um, and he has lost his wife a few years earlier, and he's now starting a new relationship with a, a woman. And, and it's like, you know, uh, he's, they, they both are kind of afraid of the word love. You know, they, they and uh, this, this little scene. Um, and also, um, when I was doing research for this, uh, my nephew is, is, is in medical school now, finishing up, he's here tonight. and. Uh, uh, a term that was used for the uh, autopsy room uh, was uh, the gross room, G-R-O-S-S, -S, the gross room. And so it sounds like I'm almost like a bad adjective. I couldn't come up with anything. Like that. <laughs> but actually, that's what it was called. And uh, so, uh, I, and, and you know who Sharon was who carried uh, the bodies over the river sticks. So anyway, uh, after... Jacob and, and Jacob has been, you know, it's tra traumatized from war. He, his wife, he, he's been told his wife is dead now. And, and so he's just gone to see the doctor. And now uh, the, the, he's left. After Jacob and Blackburn left, Dr. Egan followed the first time he'd driven to Lenore to call on Catherine. As they sat and talked in her parlor that Sunday, he noticed on the fireboard a small but conspicuous wedding picture of her and her late husband. That afternoon, Catherine told Egan about a widowed friend who refused a marriage proposal. Her friend had always believed the intensity of love shared with her deceased husband was unique and that she'd rather live alone than risk knowing otherwise. Egan knew Catherine was testing her. He told her that as a widower, he understood such a point of view. As do I, she'd answered. To the delight of a mutual friend who had introduced them, Egan and Catherine began seeing each other. The wedding picture remained on the fireboard. He drove to Lenore every other Saturday. They ate lunch at the small, same small Greek restaurant, followed by gin rummy and conversation. In the late afternoon, they'd leave her parlor for the bedroom, drape their clothes neatly on the divan. Predictable even stayed, but pleasing. Love. The word had never been spoken by either of them, as if un the unsaying inoculated. Egan poured a dram, dram of bourbon and sat down. The bereaved always wanted a reason, a specific term to pin in a family Bible. They might even request a dignified Latin word for, as they often put it, what had carried their loved one away. One elderly woman's kin, dissatisfied with old age, asked for another term, and Egan almost wrote Sharon <laughs> for her entry. But he was fresh out of medical school then, still callous from mornings beneath the gross room's harsh rafter of lights. In that stark theater, the dead, naked, nameless, ungrieved, awaited his glinting scalpel, unaccommodated man. Once he'd lifted the heart from a cadaver and held it in his palm, he turned away from his fellow students to address the cadaver. Well, my fellow, it's no longer working, but it is intact. You obviously did not die of a broken heart sin to have done that. And one piercingly recalled three years later when Helen contracted pneumonia, hovered between life and death. Callow mockery rebuked him. What? No heartbreak now? Even decades later, Dr. Egan vividly remembered those hours by Helen's bedside. 
with all his medical knowledge exhausted, he had prayed. He vowed that if Helen survived, he'd never take it for granted again. Eventually, the fever subsided and the lungs cleared. Soon enough, there were times he did take Helen for granted, failed her in many ways. But over three decades, there were always moments when he remembered those two days, the fear, the prayers, promises. As he told his adult children at Helen's funeral, he had been blessed. Right. Thank you. So Laura, we're going to uh, pose some questions to you, starting with a question from the virtual audience, if that's all right. Sure. Sound good to you. Then we'll take one from the live audience and kind of toggle back and forth. This question is from Dennis. And Dennis asks, is there a time period that you find more difficult to write in versus one that you find more enjoyable to write in? Oh, wow. That's, that's a good question. Uh, well, I, I think uh, what I've tried to do in my work, and I, I kind of, Robert Morgan has done this brilliantly. Um, what I've tried to do in my work, and I've got seven books of stories, five books of poems, and eight novels. Now, it's, it's real nice symmetry of 20. Uh, yeah, in a way, I, don't, I feel like I don't even want to write another one because it, but I, I've kind of seen it as almost like a quilt, patchwork, you know, everything, all of this is one work. So what I've tried to do in a lot of the work is kind of hit flashpoints, you know, World War One, Korea. That was a really, I think, important time. Some World War Two story, Depression, uh, Civil War era, um, 2000, uh, 2000, you know, contemporary. So I've tried to kind of work through time at these uh, what I consider pretty important moments in the region's history. Uh, but uh, they all have their challenges. Um, I, you know, this is my second book written about 1950s. My first novel is One Foot in Eden. And, and that period is interesting to me. Uh, the Korean War, for one reason, because it's a war, uh, a conflict, they call it a conflict, that really hasn't been, you know, it hasn't gotten it, in some ways the attention of Vietnam or World War II. It, sometimes it seems almost forgotten. So that is interesting. But I think the 50s are kind of an interesting time. I mean, sometimes we think not much was happening then. But, but I mean, this country was, I mean, we were really shifting. I mean, so much was going on, you know. Uh, so, I, you know, I think, I'll tell you something interesting. It just kind of struck me recently. I, I write some contemporary stories, but I'm just finding myself less and less interested because so much is being done on the Internet. I mean, it's almost like yeah, I don't want to write about the Internet. <laughs> I just don't. I just don't find it that interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, and I know writers can do it you know, well. Sally Rooney, I think you know, can, you know, that's pretty much her focus. But uh, they all have their challenges, and, and I have. Given, this is a great non-answer, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's just it just blends. It just blends. Yeah. Somebody from this audience. Hey Ron, I know you said you kind of worked with this one for like six years, and at one point you said you even thought about giving up on it. What point or like image or line did you write that kind of made you know this was kind of worth it? Yeah, Jared is one of my former students, a really good writer. So he's going to, you know, he he he'll probably be able to take on the internet with some good writing. On that. Um, I uh, uh, yeah, every novel I've written has really kind of centered on an image. Uh, Serena just had a woman on horseback. A you know, novel started that way. Uh, but this one, it really kind of took off. I knew I had to, uh, you know, I felt like, okay, I found my image now. Uh, I'll just wait for it to kind of uh, open up. Um, image, I had an image of a woman at night and she was uh, kneeling beside a tombstone. And uh, I knew it was her own grave. And she was weeping. She was in widow weeds. And I did not know if it were a ghost or a real woman. And in a way, the novel, when I was working on the novel, I, for a long time, I wasn't sure if, if which she was either. So, uh, yeah, I think that was the image that kind of, you know, and I always, if I've got that, I always kind of have a lot of faith that the image is going to lead me eventually. Uh, so, yeah, that was kind of the, the linchpin, I guess you would say. Yeah. Well, 
question from the virtual audience. Do you write with the end in mind or does it come to you as you write? Yeah, I never, never, never know where it's going to go. Uh, I, I never plot. Uh, I mean, I just go by instinct. I mean, I start to get a sense maybe after a year, of, you know, what I think. But uh, and that's kind of the, you know, I mean, I, I really admire or I think it'd be a lot easier for me because I know a lot of really good writers who do kind of think out the book. Uh, I think uh, Capote, Truman Capote said he had to get the first, once he got the last line, that was when he would get the last line first. And that would kind of lead him to the whole story. But uh, now I just kind of work my intuition. I've always, I mean, as I said earlier, you know, I thought I had this story. So I was already kind of locked in. Um, and I think that was the problem. But uh, yeah, I just kind of meander. And always, with every novel I've written about a year in, it all, it just dies on me completely. Um, I remember I, when I wrote Serena, I'd been writing it, working on it a year. And it just was dead. And, I, you know, about a month went by. I couldn't, you know. And at that time, Rachel, the young woman, if you've read the book, uh, was just a, she, she was only in the opening three pages. And then she wasn't even, and I was driving to Tennessee to do an event. And I was right, right up there, uh, you know, as you go through Madison, got right at the line where you go right up to the top. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly realized, Rachel, this story is as much about Rachel as it is Serena. And, 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 and I, you know, and that I knew I had the book then because I knew that her story was going to be in some way, she was going to be the character who really kind of changed the most and, and kind of bound a counterpoint. And I was so happy and I driven that road a lot. And I just was so excited and happy that I just went over that thing, which, and I knew, I knew that any other time, you know, there's always a patrolman down there or very often. And sure enough, you know, I was like going 75. And I just thought, you know, I must have looked like, I mean, I'm surprised it didn't take me any thought probably was on drugs because I, I just kind of grinned at him. And, you know, I mean, and I mean, it was almost like this karmic thing where I felt, okay, you know, it's got to balance out, you know, and I'm okay with it. You know, you, you can make it 80, I don't, you know. But, uh, but, but yeah, but those are the moments, you know, those moments come and suddenly, you know, everything kind of comes together. Audience question? Yeah. Uh, so what was that last piece? Uh, since you finished the book, how fast were you driving on the way here? Oh, oh, I'm I'm fine now. You know, I, I can die. You know, it's done. You know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm back to driving normal. But I, I, but that that actually is true. I mean, when I get near the end of a book, I, I really kind of start getting scared. You know, that something's going to happen. You know, I, you know, I look up and make sure something's not going to fall. <laughs> I'm insane. <laughs> Another uh, live audience question, please. I'm curious about um, the film adaptations of your work. Um, I've heard that it can be a great process and, and also a terrible one. So is one more positive than the other? And can you tell us about what that was like? Well, I, I, I'd had friends who had had, including Charles, Charles Frazier, who's a friend, good friend. Um, and, and I knew, the one thing I, I knew from all of them was, they're not going to listen to you. Uh, and, and so I just stayed out of it. Uh, I mean, I didn't have anything to do with uh, uh, Serena. And I'm, I mean, that, that's a bad movie. I yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I couldn't, I, I couldn't figure out why they, you know, to make her weak. But um, one funny thing did happen with Serena. Toby Jones played the sheriff in that, and he's a British actor. Uh, you would probably recognize him. He's in a lot of movies, always more of a minor role, but... Uh, he called me and I, I thought he wanted to talk about the, uh, you know, the sheriff and uh, in that or in the in the Serena. Uh, and uh, after a few minutes, I realized he, he really wasn't asking me any questions. And, uh, you know, I, and somebody had said, you know, they really do talk like this down there. And he was listening to my accent. I mean, he, <laughs> I, mean I mean, really, he was. Yeah, yeah. And he admitted it. Like, <laughs> yeah, the, the world made straight, though, it's an indie. Uh, and it was actually by, uh, made by North Carolina. And that, you know, I, once again, I didn't have anything to do with it really, except, you know, I'd answer a couple of questions, but uh, I think that's a good movie. I mean, I'm very pleased about that, but and mainly because Steve Earls in it. 
you know, who's one of my heroes. And uh, when I was working on that book, sometimes I have a song that kind of stays in my head and Copperhead Road was in my head when I was working on that novel and it just fit. So, uh, yeah. Question from the virtual audience about the dead point that you mentioned earlier. This is from Natalie, I'm oh, sorry, Natalia. How do you resurrect a novel from the dead point? And are there novels that you started and have not been able to continue. Well, when I was early, early, you know, late twenties, I wrote two novels, and uh, they, were, they were just bad, and I, I burned them, and, <laughs> and they're gone. And and that is a, a good thing for the world. <laughs> but yeah, but you know, I was learning. That's okay. You know, you, you're learning your craft, or and uh, and and I actually kind of gave up on trying to write. I didn't think I could do them when I kind of quit and started writing stories and poems, uh, or continued and kind of focused on that in my thirties. And then as I got into my mid forties, I kind of came back one foot in Eden, kind of came to me. And I don't know, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting. Writers are like athletes. I think they have a certain period where they can do something really well. Uh, and you know, I, I love Faulkner. And Faulkner from about 1929 to 19, well, 1942, 13 years, but mainly I'd say 29 to 38, you know, all the great books were pretty much in that time. Sound of Fury, Light in August, uh, As I Lay Dying, uh, you know, Absalom. And, 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 you know, I think that's when the writers just have this moment where they can kind of, they hit, you know, wisdom, energy, maybe the right subject. And uh, so, yeah, I, and, and I think that came later for me. Some writers hit it, Faulkner hit it pretty young. He was pretty much in his thirties when I, he was writing his greatest work, but then other writers, you know, fifties, sixties, I think it just depends. But, but I do think there's a certain period where, and, and for me, the novel writing really came mid forties to mid fifties. That's when I think I, I did my best novels writing. Uh, Final question from the audience, uh, and we're at the we'll pass the top of the hour, so we'll have to end it with that one and brief. Um, when you wrote in the valley, um, did you have a compulsion to say more than you did in Serena? And the other question is, was the demise of Galloway's mom the darkest moment of your writing career? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I never, I didn't want to write a sequel. I mean, I've always, you know, Ghostbusters 2 or whatever. <laughs> but, but I, you know, I kind of given up on this novel, The Caretaker, and, and I, and I, the Serena's story, I, I'd always felt like, uh, you know, kind of, if, if you know that book, uh, that Rachel has, has kind of gotten to the Northwest, but I kind of wanted to make it clear that she's going to be okay. I mean, I think we sense that, but uh, um, but I, I'd also the thing that really kind of hit me with that was that there was a character, one of the loggers in, in, in the original Serena was named Ross, and he had always been a character that I knew there was a lot more going on with him. He's actually, if you, you know, he's probably the one that maybe has the most wit, but there's a kind of dark wit, sophisticated wit, and so. Uh, when I wrote In the Valley, I kind of thought wanted to center on him because he was a character I found really interesting. And uh, but also, yeah, I wanted uh, I thought I wanted him to kind of have a victory against what because he, he cared. He knew Rachel knew of her and he, he knew that he had to protect her because uh, the, the uh, Galloway's mother has second sight so she can find her. And so. Yeah, it was a dark moment. I mean, that that scene, uh, uh, I'm glad it happened <laughs> to her. I enjoyed doing that. But but the other thing I wanted to, yeah, to do, I'd never written a novella. And that's a really interesting form. Uh, I love Jim Harrison's novellas. Um, Dennis Johnson, maybe my favorite American novella, novella is, is Train Dreams, which is incredible. Um, so I wanted the challenge of that because I'd never written one. But but the most fun I had in that book was I said, you know, I'm going to do something interesting with these loggers. And I kind of done some of this with Serena, but I, I had them, uh, they speak in iambic pentameter in, uh, in the valley. And I thought that's kind of fun, you know, just kind of giving these 
you know, use a, an Appalachian dialect and yet put it in, you know, into this uh, Shakespearean metric. That, uh, that, that was fun. That was really fun. And, uh, you know, we do certain things as writers to uh, amuse ourselves. <laughs> so I was, yeah, that, that was, a, but, 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 you know, I thought it worked. And I, it's not like the reader's going to catch that, but the reader's ear will catch it. I'm convinced of that. So, uh, but yeah, it, I, I felt like it fit. I, and it, it really kind of, for me, felt like, okay, I got raw. I, I found this story and uh, it made me kind of happy. Thank y'all for coming out. Thank you.